Uh, before I introduce our keynote speaker for today, uh, I'd like to give you some uh, logistic announcements. First, uh, there are two passports which someone lost and we can't, we, we're having a hard time finding the owner. So if you lost your passport, please contact us. Second, uh, <laughs> uh, tomorrow there is uh, the beach party at the, at the evening and there is some limited time when you can still enter the, the sea. So if you want to do that, please bring your bathing suit with you so you can change here and go directly from here to the beach. Uh, and third announcement, if you're a vegetarian or... What? <laughs> bracelets. Bring your bracelets. Okay. Uh, third, third announcement. If you're a vegetarian or vegan and you cannot find your special food at the... Uh, just ask the catering people and they will tell you where it is. Um, okay. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Joseph Riegel, who is an assistant professor at Northeastern University and a fellow at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. Uh, he uh, published a book called Good Faith Collaboration, which is basically just about Wikipedia. Um, uh, and that's it, but basically, I'm delighted to uh, invite him to talk to you. Good morning, everyone. If you'd like to follow along, actually, these slides are online at regal.org slash talk. It's just a web page, so you can click on some of the references if you're curious. So in light of Wikipedia's 10th year anniversary, one might have encountered a number of stories or tales, creationists about Wikipedia's origins and how it's progressed over those 10 years. So you might have heard that Wikipedia was an extraordinarily innovative, undertaking or it was actually the fulfillment of a centuries old pursuit. One might have heard that it was a brilliant notion or perhaps an accident, and one might hear discussion of Wikipedia being a global boom, a benefit to everyone that encounters it, or perhaps a harbinger of doom. So those are some of the stories I want to talk about this morning. So innovation and or prophecy. I argue in my book and presently right here that there is this thing that we might call the universal encyclopedic vision. And this was a technology-inspired vision seeking to wed increased access to information with global uh, human accord. And I think we can see antecedents in Wikipedia with respect and within this vision in print, microfilm, and network projects. So I want to touch on a couple of those cases. So we could go back to the 18th century, Denis Diderot, famous editor of the French Encyclopedia associated with the Enlightenment. And I think even if you go back this far, you can see some foreshadowing of Wikipedia with respect to good faith efforts and maybe even uh, some Wikipedia policies. So Diderot wrote that the Encyclopedia was done by a society of men, and I'll note that was men at the time, unfortunately, exclusively all bound together solely by their zeal for the best interests of the human race and a feeling of mutual goodwill. That does not sound that dissimilar to how we might understand Wikipedia today, except with the inclusion of women, hopefully. Uh, also, with respect to sort of neutrality and verifiability, Ditter wrote that he hoped bias and national prejudices could be eliminated from the encyclopedia by giving cross-references to different articles such that the work would have the power to change men's common way of thinking. And this isn't exactly like neutral point of view because I think when he's talking about cross-references, it sounds a little bit more like wiki info where you might have a pro and a con article, whereas with neutral point of view, we're trying to integrate them together. But nonetheless, there is this idea, even hundreds of years ago, that reference works when done uh, with the intention of trying to fairly represent all major viewpoints on something via verifiable resources. This would be a good thing. And in fact, I sometimes teach a conflict management class and I actually ask my students to write about a controversial topic, both from a biased point of view and neutral point of view. And I bring in Wikipedia's neutral point of view as part of that exercise. So I think it's quite interesting. Now moving into the beginning of the 20th century, there was a lot of interesting things happening at that time, and I want to talk about two people in particular, Paul Otley and H.G. Wells. Now, print had been around for some time, but there was a new technology on the horizon that people were really excited about. 
and that was microfilm, microfiche, index cards, and binders. And Paul Otle was a Belgium documentalist, at using the term where we get our word for document from, an internationalist and a pacifist quite ahead of his time. And here we can see an example of one of his uh, catalogs from his repertoire bibliographique universal. And he did some really extraordinary things, including an extension of the Dewey Decimal System that he borrowed and beefed up, including the inclusion of some facets for queries. So he actually had a query language almost for querying these index card catalogs. Um, he also had this idea of monographic principle, which I'll talk a little bit about more. And he was actually fairly forward thinking. He wrote of inventions to be discovered, including the remote reading and annotation of documents as well as computer speech. And I think in his vision and actually in his work, because he did some real things, we can see a shared uh, conception of production with Wikipedia even at the beginning of the 20th century. So Otle wrote that his biblion, his permanent encyclopedia, would be a systemic, complete current registration linking together materials of all the information scattered around the world. So again, this is almost um, foreshadowing hypertext. With respect to no original research, Otley wrote that his encyclopedia um, will be made by people who summarize and ultimately synthesize the works. Their intention is not to do original research, but rather to preserve what has been discovered and to gather in our intellectual harvests. So here we can see no original research almost 100 years ago. I also want to talk about H.G. Wells from this period. Uh, like Otle, his idea was not an immediate brainstorm, but certainly he was a creature of the time, very much uh, a product of a number of long-standing interests, in including index cards, universal socialism, and global institutions. So he wrote, and this is quite a nice quotation, the time is close at hand when a student in any part of the world will be able to examine any book, any document, an exact replica. And that sounds almost like um, what Wales had expressed as a mission for Wikipedia and the current foundation's Wikipedia mission. He also spoke about speed. He said a world encyclopedia no longer presents itself as a bunch of books printed and stored on the shelves and gathering dust. Rather, it needs to be a depot where knowledge and ideas are received, sorted, summarized, digested, clarified, and compared. It would be in continual correspondence with that which is happening out there in the world. Again, extraordinarily prescient. And this is one of my favorite quotations and a motif I make a great deal of use of in the book. Oh, I have water, thank you, under here. Uh, so he wrote of a global jigsaw. He said he wants his world encyclopedia to be the means that could solve the problem of that jigsaw puzzle and bring all the scattered and ineffective mental wealth of the world together into a common understanding. And I just love this fact that he used this metaphor of a global jigsaw when in fact the Wikipedia logo, as we all know, is an incomplete global jigsaw. Now moving on from the days of microfilm and index cards, uh, there were lots of predecessors in the networked world. So I think we could actually go back to Project Xanadu and Ted Nelson. He was sort of the originator of hypertext and concept, and he was actually somewhat bitter when the web came to be the dominant way that people used the internet, because he thought his notion of hypertext was much better, and in principle and theory it was. But again, he was inspired by this notion of a vision that human affairs could be significantly bettered, and perhaps we could prevent imminent doom by the expansion and dissemination of intelligence through the use of hypertext. Moving forward a decade or so, we also have Project Gutenberg. I'm sure a lot of people have heard of Project Gutenberg. You know, they, they take works in the public domain and put them online, and you might think, what does that have to do with Wikipedia? I think it has two interesting things to do with Wikipedia. First, the people associated with Gutenberg were very much interested in getting a free encyclopedia online. Now, the way they conceived of that project was scanning an old edition, the 11th edition from 1911, uh, of Britannica and putting that online. And actually at the beginning of Wikipedia, there was some discussion of whether the material from the Encyclopedia Britannica 11 could be used to populate Wikipedia. And there was some, it was one of the best reference works at the beginning of the 20th century, it was the best reference work, but it's obviously rather dated too. Um, but their efforts to try to get the Encyclopedia 
Britannica, 11 online, I think was sailing it for Wikipedia. And also there's the Distributed Proofreaders Project. When people talk about pre-production, I don't think they get quite enough attention as they should. And the intention of uh, Distributed Proofreaders was to take all this work that people had to do before alone, typing in you know, a manuscript or going over the errors in an optical character recognition transcript, and instead distributing it such that people could do a task like a couple paragraphs at a time. And you'd have two people do the same paragraphs, and then you'd have another person who can reconcile the differences between the two people in case one of them made an error. And this was quite important when we start thinking about open source and free content in Wikipedia, because it allows the incremental cumulative contributions of people to accumulate. And then there's Interpedia. At the beginning of the 90s, the idea that this thing called the internet could definitely be used to host or create an encyclopedia came to the fore. And in the Interpedia fact, they write that this is being a reference source uh, made by articles submitted by individuals. These individuals would be volunteers without any formal governing structure, and everyone is encouraged to make a contribution, much like the encyclopedia that anyone is free to edit. And then there's the distributed encyclopedia. This did not have much of a run, but nonetheless, one of the problems with Interpedia, interestingly, was people said, oh, this is going to be on the internet. But would this make use of Waste or Gopher or the web? And if it was on the web, would it be part of the web? Would the web be part of it? And it's really kind of interesting. Part of my talk today is to uh, look at the ways that we often think about technology in hindsight. When we look back, we think, oh, this is silly, or it had to be this way. But when you read back about some of these early projects, they were really wrestling was with what does it mean to be on the web? Um, so. The distributed encyclopedia, at this point, people had said, yes, the web is the way to go. Again, they imagined they would take advantage of one of the salient and most important features of the web, which was decentralized content production, and that they would be able to create the biggest and deepest encyclopedia ever written, because they would be able to, again, take advantage of all the contributions from the millions of internet users and have them accumulate. And then, Nothing really came of this either, but Richard Stallman, to give him his due in terms of talking about free culture, I hear some snickers perhaps from last year's conference. Um, uh, he was very much concerned in furthering a free universal encyclopedia and uh, learning resource, and I think that is consistent with the Wikipedia vision. Then, of course, there's Newpedia, Wikipedia's famous or infamous predecessor where the idea was to create a new standard of breadth, depth, timeliness, and lack of bias. Which then brings us to Wikipedia, and it's ten, ten years. Uh, when Wikipedia was first announced on the Newpedia list, Larry Sanger sent an email saying, Interpedia is dead, long live the Wikipedia. I've been studying Wikipedia long enough, actually. I, I've done this myself. When I first started writing papers about Wikipedia, I used to say the Wikipedia. But now I think it's established enough that we just drop the the. So, kudos. Uh, and um, he wrote, Sanger wrote that Interpedia's noble dream of creating a free, open encyclopedia lives on. So again, we see a powerful vision. So was Wikipedia part of a long pursuit? I think having spent that much time and that many slides on that question, I think we can argue uh, defensively that Wikipedia is actually part of a much larger tradition. Was Wikipedia innovative? Am I saying there were new innovations in Wikipedia? I'm not saying that. I am saying that, and indeed, Wikipedia was innovative. One of the interesting ways, and this is why history is so interesting to me, was that it was innovative, is that, in a sense, it was centralized. All those preceding projects imagined people writing articles alone, and then somehow they would be linked together. And so, for example, Stallman conceived of this that way, too, and his main concern was as long as they were all under the same copyright license, all these articles, they could link to, to each other but he imagined a, 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 a um, viral or reciprocal constraint like you find in the GPL, where if you did not make your article available under a free license, I wouldn't link to you from my article. Um, and what I think Wikipedia's centralization brings is a number of important features. It enables incremental asynchronous and cumulative contributions with tools that support this, for instance, discussion pages and diffs and histories. But I think the important thing that a lot of people actually didn't appreciate it 
It means that it, it's able to foster a community and a culture. And it's Wikipedia's collaborative culture is one of the big things I focus on in my work. And none of the earlier conceptions of an internet encyclopedia, except going back 100 years, really conceived of this as uh, needing to support community. And I think that's really quite critical. So then the interesting counterfactual question to ask is, was Wikipedia inevitable? So now I want to address that. And I'm going to argue, actually, no, Wikipedia was a happy accident. So I just want to give a couple of anecdotes. And you might say I'm being provocative with this claim, and that's fair enough. Perhaps during Q&A, people want to push back on me. But just a couple of anecdotes to, 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 again, shock us out of our complacency in thinking that Wikipedia had to be the way that it is today. So again, just to touch back on the founders, uh, Jimmy Wales at BOMIS was uh, you know, running a number of web rings and search engine type facilities, and it was predominantly men's oriented portal web ring. Sanger was a graduate student who, um, whose Y2K predicted files had fizzled. He had been working uh, on a newsletter with a colleague, Shannon, about the, the uh, imminent crisis of year 2000 when all the computers would crash and airplanes would drop out of the air because the clocks couldn't turn over properly. And Y2K came and went, and he was like, what am I going to do next? So he famously emailed Jimmy, and Jimmy said, I have this idea for a project. Why don't you take it on? Also, even the founders, this was mentioned yesterday, I think maybe Sue made reference to this, didn't really appreciate perhaps what was going to come of this. And so when Sanger announced Wikipedia to the new Pedia list, he wrote, Jimmy Wales thinks that many people might find this idea objectionable. And indeed, a lot of the new Pedians did find the idea objectionable. And a quite famous uh, article in The New Yorker by Stacy Schiff, she quoted Jimmy Wales as bracing himself for an onslaught of complete rubbish. He figured that if he and Sanger were lucky, the wiki would generate a few rough drafts for Newpedia. And also, there was this question of how would it support itself? We now see that uh, the foundation is almost a juggernaut, raising extraordinary amounts of money just compared to a few years ago. Um, but originally, uh, a lot of the people involved were not quite sure how this thing would be and what it would come to be. So for example, we have uh, quotations here from both Sanger and Wales talking about the possibility of advertising being used. And this is another little famous uh, quote where Jimmy Wales went to Ward Cunningham, the inventor of the wiki, went to his wiki and asked the esteemed community there, do you think that a wiki could successfully generate a useful encyclopedia? And Ward Cunningham famously said, yes, but in the end it wouldn't be an encyclopedia, it would be a wiki. And I find this kind of interesting because what is this distinction back in 2005 so long ago that they were drawing between a wiki and an encyclopedia? And as recent as 2005, Sarah Boyd, a well-recognized expert and scholar of online media and social software, she wrote that Wikipedia needs to be respected and it's a wonderful resource, but it will never be an encyclopedia. And again, this is one of those things in hindsight, I'm just like, what, what does this mean? What is the difference between a wiki and an encyclopedia if the intention of the wiki is to develop an encyclopedia? And I actually, I think some of the things people were getting hung up on at the time, perhaps with, with respect to the original wiki, was that, for example, Wikipedia placing discussion on a separate discussion page rather than inline in wiki content was a big innovation. That's not how they used to do wikis before. And this was a big deal back then, you know. So I think that was part of it, but it still seems rather confusing to me presently. If we look at some of the ways that people talked about Wikipedia at its outset, um, I can, again, think we can see some uh, puzzlement and confusion and short-sightedness. So here we have an editorial from 2002, very much at the beginning, by Peter Jasko. He had a weekly or monthly column called Picks and Pans, where he would talk about the stuff that he thought was ridiculous out there on the web. And he said, now we have the latest endeavor that is a joke at best. Wikipedia looks like a prank. And he says they have the desire to make 100,000 articles. That's ambition, given that the sixth edition of the Columbia Encyclopedia has 51,000 articles. So these fools are going to try to double that. <laughs> now, lest you applaud yourself too loudly, I've, uh, I've talked about how the founders maybe 
how their expectations were surpassed and how critics were perhaps foolish. But even when you look at Wikipedians in terms of when they think certain things might happen, I like these betting pools when people bet on various things. And here we had the one millionth article betting pool where people would put their name down, sign, sign their name next to when they thought something would happen. So here was the winner saying that it probably happened in the beginning of March. But if you note, this was quite, you know, not that many people thought it would happen that soon. In fact, the vast majority of Wikipedians thought it would happen much, much later. So this is just one of the, the fun things about history. So okay, Wikipedia is no longer a joke, but is it deadly? This is the other sort of story I want to talk about. So just when arguments that Wikipedia would never amount to anything ceased, new arguments about its imminent death took their place. And not only would Wikipedia die, which was an argument made by law professor Eric Goldman. He said, oh, Wikipedia would be dead by 2010. And in my book, I actually write, if Wikipedia still exists when you read this book, he was wrong and he has since apologized. But other people have actually said, that uh, Wikipedia will be the death of larger culture, knowledge, and scholarship. So let's look at that. Is Wikipedia a global boom or a global doom? So given that I'm speaking to a, a room full of Wikipedians, I won't spend a lot of time on uh, the virtues of Wikipedia. But I just wanted to point out this one example, at least. Um, a lot of Wikipedians, I think, were quite happy with this at the time. This is one of the first really big mainstream recognitions of Wikipedia from the British journal The Guardian, where they said Wikipedia is one of the wonders of the internet. Um, if reflecting the essential goodness of human nature in a supposedly cynical world and fulfilling the latent desire of people all over the world to cooperate. And again, I think that's, we can go back 100 years and see that sort of sentiment. But in terms of doom, there's a lot of people that have said Wikipedia is a bad thing. Andrew Keane wrote that every visit to Wikipedia's free information hive means one less customer for professionally researched and edited encyclopedia like Britannica. Uh, Robert McHenry, a former editor of Britannica. And there's all kinds of, really, I, I have a collection of metaphors. For instance, Wikipedia has been compared to a bacchanal, to an orgy, to all kind of nasty things. And so here he says, a user who visits Wikipedia to learn about subject is in the position of a visitor to a public restroom. It might obviously be dirty. There might obviously be typos and spellos. Um, but, you know, and then you kind of know, but even if the room appears kind of clean, like maybe it's a featured article, you still don't know if it's in there. You know, there could be germs and errors and vandalism. Um, so what he certainly does not know is who has used the facilities before him. And if we know anything about Wikipedia, it's when you go to that article, hundreds and thousands and perhaps millions of people have used that article. <laughs> and, but, and one of my questions with this is, well, at least I know, kind of, I can see who pissed in Wikipedia. I go to the, the user page, but I don't know who pissed in the Britannica. So. And then here's a, a comment by Michael Gorman, a form, former head of the American Library Association. And this, this criticism seems particularly short-sighted. He wrote that, uh, Wikipedians continue to add to and intellectually lazy to use this fundamentally flawed resource. And a professor who encourages the use of Wikipedia is the intellectual equivalent of a dietitian who recommends nothing but a diet of Big Macs. And the reason I think this is particularly short-sighted amongst all the criticism I've collected and talk about in the book uh, is that last month I uh, participated in the Wikipedia and Higher Education Conference, and there's been a number of panels at this conference talking about Wikipedia and higher education. And it's gone so much further than, oh my gosh, can students cite Wikipedia? Students are contributing to Wikipedia. And from some of what I've heard so far, it's an extraordinarily rewarding process for a lot of them. Instead of writing a paper, having a professor write a grade on the top and have it forgotten, they have an opportunity to actually have what they've done be of use to other people and they get immediate feedback. So uh, I think he will perhaps one day feel a little bit chagrined about this statement. So I do think Wikipedia is an encyclopedia, but I think part of all this criticism is that it's something else. I think Wikipedia is a proxy in larger culture wars. So our understanding of reference works is very much influenced by the intention of the compilers contemporaneous reception and subsequent interpretation. And just to give you an example of that, 
Foster Stockwell, an information historian, argues that the encyclopedia's treatment of the crafts and artisans was libertarian. And this is a fairly common line on the encyclopedia. He wrote that Diderot helped set in motion the downfall of the royal family and the rigid class system. However, you can find other scholars arguing something quite different. Cynthia Cope argues that the encyclopedia was an attempt on the part of the dominant elite culture to control language and discourse and expropriate the practices and knowledge of the artisan class. And so I think one of the ways that we can think of reference works is as a mirror reflecting the concerns and values of the larger society in which it exists. And Harvey Einbender has this wonderful book detailing the history and also a lot of criticism of Britannica. And he wrote this, he said, since an encyclopedia is a mirror of contemporary learning, it offers a valuable opportunity to examine the prevailing attitudes of that society. So this was the lens that I used when I looked at the Wikipedia criticism to see if I could discern what is it that was, um, what, what sort of issues were at stake when people perhaps sometimes rightfully, perhaps sometimes wrongfully, complain or criticize Wikipedia and other Web 2.0 phenomena. So just to touch on that quickly, uh, but I also want to give you another example because I just don't want to wave my hand. There's an another wonderful book by Herbert Morton about the publication of Webster's Third in America in the 1960s. And much like the criticism of Wikipedia today, this was an extraordinarily controversial undertaking. Uh, as a schoolboy, I learned the aphorism from my teachers that ain't ain't a word. And this was actually the legacy of some of these debates. And some critics actually were quite harsh on Webster's Third for having the word ain't in the dictionary. And actually one of the discussions yesterday made me think of this. There has long been this argument in reference work production, particularly dictionaries, as to whether dictionaries and encyclopedias are supposed to be descriptive, simply describing the speech or knowledge of what is known out there in the world, or are they supposed to be prescriptive or normative, saying this is a word that you should not use, hence we're not even gonna include it in the dictionary, or this is a topic that's not appropriate or no one needs to know about, hence we're not even gonna include it in the encyclopedia. And for the most part, much like I think many Wikipedians think, um, the job of a reference work is really to be descriptive and not sort of set social mores for society at large, even if it does reflect them nonetheless. So my conclusion about Webster's second was that it wasn't inherently conservative relative to the third, rather the second was simply dated, and they both used the most advanced techniques of lexicography available to them at the time. So it's interesting, now that we have all this criticism about Wikipedia, People did use to, in fact, publish all kind of crazy rants about Britannica. Uh, McCabe is one of the famous ones. He ended up publishing these manuscript kind of rants, and they're available on the web. You can you know, click this reference and read one of them, he, where he had criticized Britannica, and he also wrote another one against Columbia. And his concern was he wasn't very fond of the papacy, and he would talk about how the castrati and the Pope's choir were castrated boys at a young age, and um, kind of interesting, and he would say, oh, if you need a reference for this, simply go to the Encyclopedia Britannica, they have an article on it. And then someone from America, he was in England, wrote him and said, I checked the Britannica and it wasn't in there. So McCabe thought, what the heck is going on? And he found evidence that the uh, Catholic American Society, who they thought Britannica was biased against them, they actually lobbied to have that material removed. And so again, we can actually see these arguments about bias in Wikipedia actually were also quite relevant to Britannica. They just weren't as public. Saying all that, I do want to touch on then the themes that I think the criticism about Wikipedia being part of the apocalypse or doom are touching upon rel relative to some of these larger social discussions. So there is this question of collaborative practice that Wikipedia raises in the mind of many. Is Wikipedia and other Web 2.0 phenomena a Maoist hive, a Maoist collective, a hive mind, uh, all these other, you know, uh, dirty bathroom, that sort of thing, or is it simply a community of individuals working together? This universal vision, the idea that a world encyclopedia would be useful and perhaps even uh, more so create greater human accord, is this a foolish utopianism that would actually never happen, or instead is this an unintended dystopia? 
So for example, some people might poo-poo on Wikipedia, though that's getting harder to do now. But even if you have to concede to the presence and effects of Wikipedia, like Andrew Keane, you still might not like the effects. You're sad that Britannica is dying or might die. Uh, you're sad that you've lost some of the record stores you like. You're sad that you've lost some of the bookstores that you've liked. There's also this encyclopedic impulse. And a lot of the discourse about Wikipedia and Wikipedians, people sometimes laud dedicated contributors, but others see a, uh, a group of obsessive nerds or a cult or all kinds of nasty things have been said about you people. <laughs> and then there's this question of technological inspiration. And so earlier I made reference to Otley's monographic principle. And again, almost 100 years ago, here was someone who was thinking of the idea that facts should be liberated from the binding of a book. And back then, they were thinking of index cards and microfilm, and you could put a fact from a book on an index card and move it around. You could read sections of books, and wouldn't that be wonderful? And again, that's present today in the discussion of, say, Kevin Kelly's discussion of liquid library or remix culture. And some people are very much excited by this, to be able to take something, to repurpose it, to remix it. But other people see this as the death of scholarship, a violation of the sovereignty of printed works, and of the moral authority of an author. Again, so this is part of the discussion. So there are many interesting tales to tell about Wikipedia. And in conclusion, where I stand with some of these and or questions, I think Wikipedia is an innovation and the fulfillment of a centuries old pursuit. I think it has, in a sense, a happy accident that surpassed the expectations of everyone involved, including the founders, the critics, and Wikipedians. And I also think it's a proxy in larger debates. But most of all, I think its progress is remarkable in these short 10 years. So it's, it's interesting. For those people that are interested in the history of online communities, uh, we really suffer from the problem of digital rot. Things are lost so much more quickly than perhaps they were with my colleagues who study print materials. And actually, the, some of the first instances of the Wikipedia database have been lost, and we cannot find those articles. But fortunately, Tim Starling, who is here, found some old database dumps, some diff files from the earliest Wikipedia that allowed us to reconstruct uh, the early Wikipedia pages. And so, for example, these diff pages were not, this diff log was not easy to read, but I wrote a little Python program to reconstruct the early Wikipedia. And I called that Wikipedia 10K Redux. It was basically, you could see the first 10,000 contributions to Wikipedia. And so this is an article I chose at random, Ardwolf, for today. And here you can see the first instance of this article. An Ardwolf is a small animal from South Africa. It's related to the hyena, lives in the ground, nocturnal hunter. So I don't know what level that would be considered today. It's really not a featured article. Um, <laughs> And also one of the interesting things you can see is they were using camel case back then. So one of the odd things with camel case was if you didn't have a multi-word term that you wanted to create a link to, you still had to throw another capital in there. So you threw it in at the end of the, at the word. And again, maybe this is one of those things that people were getting hung up at the time of, oh, you could never have an encyclopedia, it'll be a wiki. But people dealt with that problem in time. So that was 10 years ago. Today, and again, I don't think this is a particularly notable or salient page, it's just this topic I chose at random. We have a picture of this very weird creature, the Ardwolf. We have its con conservation status, its scientific classification, its range, all kinds of useful information, including pictures, diagrams, illustrations, as well as references and links. And I just love this. So well done and happy anniversary slash birthday. And uh, I just want to thank a couple of people. I want to thank the organizers of Wikimania 2011. I gave my first presentation to about 40 people at Wikimania 2006, and there's certainly a lot more people here today. And thank you for coming. I know the first session in a jet-lagged audience international conference is kind of hard to drag yourself out of bed for. Uh, definitely thanks to the organizers. This is all just HTML. You can follow the slide along uh, at home or on your laptop. I use these tools, and I'd be happy to take questions from the audience if we have time.
you have a microphone or I'll just repeat questions if I hear them? What do I think about the editor decline? Uh, I don't think I have anything that novel to say, uh, given all the other things people have said about it. I think it's unfortunate. I think uh, hopefully Wikipedia will find a way to deal with it. I think it's also to some extent inevitable in that certain topics have been addressed and covered. But I think that just means uh, Wikipedia has to uh, work harder about thinking about different groups to invite to the table to actually contribute. So to some extent, I think it was, um, it's not wholly surprising, but I also think there's things that can be done to address the situation. Yes? Uh, when you were saying Wikipedia is a happy accident that it's been decided, are you saying you think that if it hadn't been created, there would be no global impetus to this, right? Mm. So the question is, when I say Wikipedia was a happy accident, does that mean that I think uh, no global encyclopedia would be uh, existent today? I'm not really sure this is what the counter counterfactual history, that's the term they use for some sci-fi where you go back and you show that Kennedy was never assassinated or something like that and what the world would look like today. Given that history and given that progression, I think something, something would have happened. But there were so many other contingent sort of accidental decisions along the way that um, it might not have been nearly as concerned with freedom, with internationalism and universal access as, as Wikipedia is today. So another flip side of that question is, can I imagine a history in which something better than Wikipedia would have happened? And actually, I have a hard time with thinking of that. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I think we had an email contact. I'm Zico van Dijk. Uh, because of the 10th anniversary of uh, Wikipedia, I have rewritten the German article on encyclopedias. It started a year ago. And uh, I came to the conviction also that uh, Wikipedia is perfectly in line with the history of encyclopedias. And what you quoted from Mr. Gorman, who compared Wikipedia to fast food, well, this is a very old complaint from scholars about encyclopedias 200 years ago or older. Scholars were always afraid that ordinary people could go to a reference book, they read some little pieces of information and uh, believe that they are scholars by themselves, so it was always horrific for them. And they were always afraid that readers of an encyclopedia would read too little and not learn enough. Um, I have the impression that Wikipedians, in the beginning, when they were starting, they uh, had in mind the encyclopedi encyclopedias they grew up with, like Britannica or Brockhaus, and maybe not unconsciously, but that's because Wikipedia is so in line with encyclopedias. But our propaganda was totally different. In the beginning, we always said Wikipedia is totally different from the traditional encyclopedias. That is absolutely normal when you are a new, when you are new on a market, you have to emphasize that you are different. But uh, it was not the propaganda that convinced the readers about Wikipedia, it was the results they were seeing. So I think by now we should be mature enough to drop this thing that we are totally different and uh, I very much uh, like the way you said it. it's innovation, but also the fulfillment of the dreams of encyclopedias of, for centuries. Well Thank said. You. And I actually... <laughs> every year the, the, you know, the new generation of students that I see in the classroom, it's, it's a bit scary. So for me, I studied Wikipedia, it was this new amazing thing and now I'm getting old, it's 10 years on. For a lot of these kids, they've only known a world with, with, with Wikipedia. And perhaps there will come a day when they would look back at a printed copy of Britannic and say, but well, where's the discussion page? You know, where's the sources? How, how can you trust us? Uh, any other questions? I see a hand over here. Um, Joseph, thank you so much. Um, I, I think your book is awesome, as you know, and um, I'm really grateful for your scholarship into Wikipedia. I think it's really, really important. I want to ask you a question. I know that your area of expertise is not gender issues, but I also know that you've been doing some research into and thinking about the gender gap on Wikipedia. 
and I know you're an academic, so I know you probably don't want to speculate too much, but I'm curious, could you speculate a little bit about how you think Wikipedia, the culture of Wikipedia might change as more women um, come to be involved in it, either on what it might take to have that happen or what change might result when that does happen? So thank you, Sue. Um, so this past year, once the book was published, I've been working on publishing some work related to the gender gap. And the one paper was a quantitative analysis. It's the largest comparison of articles between Britannica and Encyclopedia to see if I could discern a bias in biographical coverage. And uh, that was pretty interesting. I think there is a bias for some reason. Women are more common among missing articles at Wikipedia than they should be. Uh, the other thing I've been thinking about is the actual causes of why is there this gender gap in free culture. And there I make an argument that I think sometimes that geek identity can be alienating. And while we love these ideas of openness and freedom, myself included, I think they have a hidden dark side. And so part of that is that an open community is often a community with some assholes. And you know, while they might be alienating to a lot of people, they might be particularly alienating to uh, women who have confidence issues associated with technology, um, or with different sort of styles of discourse. And also the rhetoric of freedom can um, discourage people from appreciating that there are systemic problems. So for example, if you have an open community um, with a lot of male geeks, and some of them are rather sort of maybe boisterous or argumentative and alienating people, and people can say, oh, this is a shame. Why are there no women in this community? You can say, freedom. You know, it's, it's a meritocracy. Anyone can come, we're an open community. So if women here aren't here, or if another minority aren't here, it's their choice and their problem. So I think those are some of the problems, at least. And that's something else to the question of how that might be addressed or what things might change when women do come. Hard to say, again, I'm hesitant to say since I haven't thought about it very uh, carefully. But I think there is a sentiment, and I talk about this in some of the work, that if Wikipedia can be successful in being um, as welcoming as, and as friendly as possible, uh, that rising tide will raise all ships. So I think it'll, be, um, it'll make it much more easy for women in other communities who are underrepresented to participate, as well as making it more um, fun, as one of the talks was discussing about yesterday. What was the term? There's a, a German fellow. What was it? Yeah, and you had this expression like happy and something. Happiness and glamour, right? So we want to see further happiness and glamour on Wikipedia. Hi, I just wanted to add a, a small comment to the uh, the notion that maybe these encyclopedias or uh, compiled works might be making people read less. And uh, some people have said the same thing about the internet. I think that uh, one of the great things about Wikipedia and, and hypertext in general is that we are able to have uh, smaller texts in more digestible chunks, which ends up um, both these small uh, portions of text and the uh, linking between them makes people actually read more. And I'm sure many people here are familiar with the XKCD comic, The Problem with Wikipedia, which we start reading something and then following the links and we end up like spending two hours and reading completely different things that we started with. So in a way, and this is a personal experience that I'm sure many people here have felt as well, uh, I think we end up reading more than we would like. I, I wouldn't just grab a book with 200 pages about a topic, but I would read an article about that and then follow the links that I find more interesting. So maybe this is a different perspective that um, people should consider when they say that people are reading less. And I would like to make a second comment, uh, which might be an interesting um, thing to consider, because when you were saying about um, um, how the, compil uh, the compiled versions of, of um, reference works uh, might uh, show the values of the culture at the time, um, whether this could, uh, whether the uh, opening or closing of the, our notability um, policies could uh, make it a harder or easier work for future historians to find out what was the cultural values of uh, our current, uh, I mean, of the, um, the a snapshot of, of each period that Wikipedia covered. And while I was thinking that, I figured out that probably the discussion pages and, and the histories would provide a much richer 
way to uh, tap into that, so it shouldn't be a problem anyway, but I think it would uh, be an interesting idea for people to consider. Mm -hmm. Thanks. To historians in the future as well as scholars today, I don't do comparative analysis myself, but people are looking at the differences between your practices <coughs> at the German Wikipedia, English Wikipedia, Japanese Wikipedia, and it is really a source of wonderful uh, research material to understand some of the differences in these culture and how they manifest themselves in this mediated environment. Okay, last question. Yes, thank you. I'd like to just give um, a thought towards Sue's question about women's involvement in Wikipedia. And so I think that one of the issues that has kind of been skirted around is the childbearing years. I think the women either have to be before or after, otherwise you're very busy. And I think one of the, the populations that are not being addressed, and I think what you should consider, is the older women post-retirement. Instead of sitting and playing bridge, four people in a room could be sitting and each one writing an article about something that they become proficient in in their lifetime. And the women outlive the men, and there are many older women who <laughs> could be trained in a simple format of uh, applying <laughs> articles. Okay, thank you. Yeah, th okay, thank you. So we have a coffee break now, uh, it's a bit shorter than planned, please be back on time for the next session. <laughs>